we're grateful and humbled by that truth. That Jesus paid it all. Holy Spirit, we confess. We confess and acknowledge that at times we don't believe that truth. Every lustful thought, every anger, murderous affection, our apathy over the things of God, a lack of generosity in our life in terms of not forgiving those that have wronged us, holding offenses over people's heads and the resentment that undoubtedly is in the room in people's hearts, the jealousy that can consume our minds as we think about what we don't have and what others do, desire for people to like us and people loom large in our life and you're small. Father, your word says, your word says by the lips of our King and Savior and friend and Lord Jesus, it is finished. There is nothing else that sinful men, women, boys and girls must do to have the stain of sin and the penalty of sin removed from our lives, but to bend and yield our lives to Jesus. And when we do, your word says, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. There is no shame. There is no guilt. We have peace with the blood. We've been justified. We've been declared not guilty through Christ. Jesus, you have paid it all. You bore the burden of our sin. It would crush us. But you carried not only mine, but, but the world. And experienced an excruciatingly painful death, not just physically, but the pain of spiritual separation, but for a moment. We're grateful as we pray and as we talk to you, Father, that your word says in the book of Psalms that you incline your ear to hear the prayers and the pleas and the confession and the adoration and the praise of your people. We are not righteous in and of ourselves, but we come to you through the shed blood of Christ in whom we have hope and joy that no matter what comes into our lives, no matter what comes into our lives, whether it's the sin that we have thrust upon others or the sin that's thrust upon us, brokenness and chaos and confusion and doubts and anxiety and depression and our struggle, none of that has the last word you do. So Father, as we're singing, we want to worship you. As we sit down in just a moment and hear the word preached, we want to worship you you with all of our lives, with all of our mind, with, with the totality of our heart, we submit ourselves to you. We confess there's so many distractions and aspirations and desires and pursuits and struggles that take up residence in our heart. Holy Spirit, right now, would you remind us of whose we are? And that we would seek to worship you, that we would seek to listen and believe and do the word. Where else can we go but to you, Christ? You have the words of life. Thank you for what you are doing in and through our church. To the renown and praise of our great king. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if this picture describes your life. Um, we'll do a little audience participation day here at Graceland. Who would say that the figure on the left, look at these, she's even, I think that's a gal, she's even, she's even wearing a helmet, look at that. Who would say that, that really conveys my life, just, just smooth sailing, no bumps on the road. In the first service, <clears throat> God bless these two individuals. I, don't, I couldn't see their face. They rose their hand and said the, the illustration on the left conveys 
my life. Maybe they didn't understand. And I said, you know, if you're, if you're sitting near to them, just reach out and just love them because they have low awareness, okay? And, uh, you know, hopefully they're a member, they're gonna come back. Hopefully that wasn't their first time as a guest. Um, that would be bad. Figure two is really more of our life, isn't it? More um, descriptive of our life. Now, if we had to be really accurate, we'd say not only are you going uphill, but you're going uphill and sometimes you're going down and sometimes you're like taking like 19 steps back, right? You ever feel like that? You're, you're getting traction in the Christian life. You're, you're doing well. You're in the disciplines. You're, you're, you're experiencing victory over your sin. There's a joy. There's John 10.10, 10, this abundant life that Jesus came to give us. You're, you're sensing that. You're, you're walking in that. And then all of a sudden, you got maybe a little haughty, got a little prideful, and you got maybe a little full of yourself, and, and maybe you made a, made a stupid decision or I made a mess out of things. And aren't we grateful that Jesus paid it all? That illustration on the left is, is really a, a glimpse of um, an illustrative of, of your life and my life. Whether you're a Christian or not, there's ups and downs. There's mountains and the proverbial valleys, there's highs and lows, there's joys and there's difficulties. How does that apply to what we are looking at this morning? We are going to be in the book of Exodus. Exodus is a story of uh, God and his goodness and his sovereignty redeeming and rescuing a people, and yet these people experience highs and lows. They are the recipient of rescue and redemption, seeing God do miraculous things. And in the very next verse or chapter, they doubt, they struggle. It's a picture of our life. We are, as I've said before, we're a modern day Israelite. Highs and lows, ups and downs. For the next several weeks, we're gonna be in the book of Exodus. We are gonna be talking about seeing and savoring God in the midst of suffering, seeing and savoring God in the midst of his deliverance of his people, seeing and savoring God, how he's faithful to his promises, and seeing and savoring God because he is glorious and transcendent and magnificent. The, the Exodus event is, is an incredible book, an incredible historical account. You, you have this adventure of these, these two powerful nations, Israel and Egypt, Moses, who is this hero that God uses to bring about redemption and rescue and an exit or departure. You have Pharaoh, who is this villain who wants to continually enslave the people of God. You, you've got uh, the ten, you got, you got the plagues, you've got the Ten Commandments, you've got God speaking through a burning bush. You've got in the first part of Exodus, after uh, in the latter part of Exodus, you've got the, the death angel marching, and think about this, a death angel marching through the camp of the Egyptians and the Israelites, smiting the firstborn of those who did not adhere to God's word of provision and protection. It's an amazing book. This historical account was something that the Israelites wanted to pass on to their kids and grandkids. We see it in Psalm 78 and Psalm 88 and many uh, passages elsewhere where they, where they wanted to so ingrain into their hearts and minds about this actual historical event where God brought about departure and exit from a people that had enslaved them. In fact, later in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 23, when the exiles are coming home from not the Egyptians, but they had experienced redemption, rescue, another exodus, Jeremiah calls it, from not the Egyptians, but the Babylonians, it was something that really uh, was emblazoned on their mind as they thought about what God had done for them. The word exodus means departure or exit. It's not even mentioned until Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, where it says that the Israelites left. You say, well, that's not the word Exodus. Well, when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, it's called the Septuagint. Say it with me. Septuagint, the, the Greek trans, translation of the Hebrew scriptures. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, when they translated and the Israelites left, they translated with the word, uh, the verb exodus, and an exit or a departure. And so it became commonly referred to as exodus, and that's how we have our name of the book, Exodus, exit or departure. But how did we get here in Exodus? You can stay seated. I'm going to read Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 for us. 
this morning. And as we always say, this is God's word. Thanks be to God. If you see fit, I want to encourage you to do that as we want to have reverence and gratitude for God through his word. Here's what Moses writes in Exodus chapter one, verses one through seven. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So are we going to walk through this passage? Well, we will, but, but not yet, because I got to give you a little context. My, my wife has one living grandparent, and that's uh, Mama Bonnie. And, and Mama Bonnie, maybe like some of, of your relatives, she'll walk into a room um, when you're halfway through a movie or a, a show, and she will pepper you with questions. Who is that? What's going on? Why did he say that? What's the plot? And we'll say, Mama Bonnie, you're going to have to either wait or we'll watch it again with you so that you'll understand context. Now, I, I at times will do this when my kids are watching a movie. I'll come into the room and I'll say, what's going on? And my kids will say, Bonnie, Bonnie, <laughs> which I think which I think is deeply offensive and dishonorable to Mama Bonnie, okay? Maybe you've done that as well, but uh, Mama Bonnie would ask, what's, what's going on in Exodus 1? How did we get here? How did we get to Exodus chapter 1 with the Israelites in Egypt? Well, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. You're like, oh my goodness, how, how long do I have to sit here and listen? Just another three hours, okay? The doors are locked. You can't leave. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we read about how uh, God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation and I am going to bless you. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 15. God says to Abraham, lift up your eyes and look. I'm going to make you, Abraham, a great nation. Genesis 15, verse 5. Look up at the heavens and count the stars. If you indeed can count them, meaning you can't count them, so shall your offspring be. It was called a unilateral covenant, a unilateral covenant, a unilateral promise, not a bilateral covenant or promise. You say, Nate, what's the difference? It was a unilateral covenant or promise. One, one person, God committed himself to Abraham and said, I am going to bless you. I am going to make your name great. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. Why is that important? In the same way that Jesus enacts and ratifies and establishes a covenant, a promise with us, if it was left up to you and me, he says, I'm going to enter into a bilateral covenant. It's going to be Jesus and Nate, and Jesus is going to accomplish his part, and then Nate, you got to accomplish his part. If that's what we are engaging in, we are in trouble because I fail every single day. You fail every single day. It was a unilateral covenant where God pledged himself. I'm going to do this. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1 verse 2 and Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, God does not, what? Lie. God tells the truth. He's distinctly different than us. We want to be truth tellers. We want to live in the light, but we struggle God is not like us. He entered into a unilateral covenant. Genesis chapter 22, he says it again. I'm surely gonna bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars and the sky and the sand on the seashore. Abraham's son was Isaac. He repeats this promise to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. I will bless you and increase the number of your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, descendants. And again, Isaac had a son whose name was Jacob. He gives the promise again to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. And then in Genesis 35, verse 11, and then verse 12. And you're like, okay, finally, we're to Exodus. Not yet. Genesis 37, we come to a really 
important chapter. Jacob had 12 sons. And one of his sons' name, one of his sons' name was Joseph. And the Bible actually records this, that Jacob loved his son Joseph more than any other of his sons. Parents, grandparents, or people who have common sense. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing, okay? Favoritism is not good. And his brothers, Joseph's brothers, hated him. Hated him. Like not, hey, we had a squabble at dinner. Hey, I'm not gonna include Joseph in the game of tag. I'm not gonna let him play Apex Legends. If you don't know what that is, a little cultural reference. They hated Joseph, hated him. So much so that they throw him into a hole that he cannot get out of. They see a caravan come by. They sell their brother into slavery. They take the coat that their dad Jacob had given to Joseph. They put some blood on the coat, take it back to their dad Jacob and say, and a wild animal has mauled and killed your son, Joseph, our brother. And Jacob wept. Okay. Now, you say, well, I can identify. My kids squabble a lot. You know, that's not true, okay? Not like this, okay? The, the most, uh, you know, the, the most frustration I have is like refereeing who's gonna do what chore. Like somebody said last night, I did the dishes yesterday. I was like, well, you know what's crazy? Here's what's crazy. We use dishes every day. Every day, somebody has gotta unload that dishwasher and load it. And your mom and I ain't doing it ever again, you're an indentured servant in our house, okay? And so they'll complain, they'll referee. But it's never gotten to the point where some of the siblings hated another sibling and they called up Russia on the phone and said, we wanna orchestrate a kidnapping of one of our siblings because we can't stand him or her. This is next level stuff going on here in Genesis 37. Then in Genesis 46, verse three, God promised Jacob, do not be afraid. He tells Jacob, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I'm gonna make you a great nation. Then last Genesis reference, chapter 46, verse eight, is the same verbiage and words and language, the same passage, the same words that we see in Exodus chapter one, why? Because God wants us to understand he made a promise to Abraham, made it to Isaac, made it to Jacob, made it to the Israelites, and made it to you, and made it to me, and he's gonna come through on his promises. Population increase, making your name great, worldwide blessing through your offspring and citizenship in a special land that is not theirs. We know that this blessing came not through, uh, came not through Israelites, but the blessing came through, the promise, the fulfillment of this blessing came through one person, that is namely Jesus. You say, where do you get that? If you were to go to Galatians chapter three, verse 16, Paul's writing to a group of churches right into a group of churches. And in Galatians chapter three, verse 16, he says, he says, the promise came through your offspring, Abraham. He does not say offsprings, plural. He says your offspring. And he even, he even writes down in scripture, meaning singular, a singular offspring, that your name is gonna be great, your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore through one person, Jesus Christ. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. So one of the things I want you to see throughout this sermon series in Exodus is that Israel's Exodus is much like ours. Israel's Exodus is like our Exodus. One of the things that I was thinking about as I was preparing to preach, a couple of things. One is this, I need to be reminded about God's truth. I need to be reminded about God's promises. I forget, I engage, as I've said before, in theological amnesia, or I forget the promises. Why do we have to sing Jesus paid it all? 
Because some of us walked in here this morning or tuned in online or will watch later and we walk in shame and we walk in guilt and, and, and when we feel like God's just fed up. One more time, this confession, we gotta remind ourselves, Jesus paid it all. Well, that's why, as you hear me talk about the gathering, it's so important. This should, just, this should be a priority. It should be one of primacy in your life where we come together. It's not only about you. It's not only about me. We come together and we remind ourselves, we recalibrate our heart and affections to what matter. And we, we remind ourselves, Jesus paid it all. He started a good work in me, right? Philippians chapter one. He, Christ, who started a good work in you, is faithful to complete it. There's no such thing as an unfinished work in God's economy, we have to continually remind ourselves the verbiage in Exodus 1, verse 7 should hearken us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 21 and verse 28, where God gives a directive to Adam and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply, a command that I enjoy in the Millican household. It's a directive given to Adam, but now given to Abraham and a nation, and the Genesis language is carefully selected and applied to Abraham and the Israelites to show that God is a promise-keeping God. The Bible goes together. It's not just fragmented stories with no, with discontinuity. They go together. Another principle that I gleaned as I was thinking about Exodus chapter one is that I often allow my circumstances to teach me what is truth rather than understanding what is truth and looking at, looking at my circumstance through the lens of truth. What do I mean by that? I'm sure you could raise your hand, but I I'm asking you not to. Has there ever been a time where you had serious doubts? Has there ever been a time where you question, what in the world are you doing, God? Has there ever been a time where you felt like God was slow to his promises? Has there ever been a time where you thought God is somehow asleep at the wheel? One of the things we learn through Exodus is that he has not forgotten the Israelites. He's not forgotten you. He's not forgotten me. And that we can't look at our circumstances often and say, this is what truth is. Sometimes we might be inclined to say, well, God's not good. God's not for me. God's not sovereign. He does not have a plan. He's not orchestrating this great purpose and fulfillment to bring to fruition. And we know that's not true. God is good. He's for us. He's kind. He's compassionate. He loves us. He's committed to seeing his promises come to bear in your life and my life. We need to be reminded of those truths. You need to be reminded of these things because time and time again, I forget these truths in my heart. So remember, Israel's exodus is like our exodus. Jacob and his family moved to Egypt, right? There's a famine. They're gonna die if they don't go get food, so they go to Egypt. Joseph, unbeknownst to his, his dad Jacob, Joseph did not die in slavery but rose to prominence he is second in charge. He oversees all of Pharaoh's resources. The promises of God are being fulfilled. They're now in Egypt. How many people are there? There's 70. And several years later, Jacob dies. And all of his sons. The families in Egypt, which God told them what happened, they're in a foreign land with foreign people worshiping all sorts of foreign, strange gods and goddesses except the God of the Bible, and a whole generation passes away. Exodus chapter one, verse six. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But, the but denotes change, right? A change in directions. But, before we go there, they've been thus far 350 years since they made the trek to Egypt to escape famine and death. No Abraham, no Isaac, no Jacob, no Joseph, and as far as anyone can tell, there's been no fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham and which he shared time and time again to Isaac and to Jacob. However, the family did not die. The family did not disappear. 
What did God do? God preserved them as a people and they became known as the Israelites. That became their home. And for a long time, for a long time, they lived happily, peacefully. But that will change as we'll look at verses 8, 22 through next week. But I want you to see the relevance of the scriptures, the relevance of the biblical timeline, the relevance of what God is doing. God is not slow and seeing his promises come to fruition. I know sometimes it feels slow. Sometimes it feels just awful. Painful. Exhausting at times. Perhaps you have come this morning and it is everything that you can do to physically muster up a half smile because you are on the verge of despair. Or perhaps... You're close to even abandoning these things. I'm just, I'm just not sure I believe these things anymore. And I want to appeal to you that people may have forgotten the promises of God and they may think that God is slow to seeing his promises fulfilled, but God hasn't and God won't not fulfill his promises. God always fulfills his word, And we want to, as the Israelites would undoubtedly say this, and they said it many, many times throughout Exodus, as we'll see, they, they want to see God in their suffering. We want to see God in our suffering, understanding that Israel's exodus is much like our exodus. We want to see God in our suffering. We want to see God in our confusion, in our doubts. In our questions, we want to see God in our struggles with sin. We want him to encourage us and comfort us and confront us when we get it wrong and guide us and remind us and teach us and sustain us. God had promised to make Israel into a great nation and God was going to do exactly that despite despite what they didn't see. And I just want to encourage you this morning God does a million and one things every second of every day of every week. And perhaps we get a glimpse into one or two or three of those, but God is always working. God is always working. He's always doing things. And his plans cannot be thwarted. In fact, listen to what Solomon writes in Proverbs 21, verse 30. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan, that can succeed against the Lord. There are no schemes of the evil one. There is no philosophies. There is no governments. There is no schemes. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. We see this in chapter one, verse seven. There's the the selection and the frequency of the words is purposeful as it literally reads. This is what it literally says in verse seven. As for the Israelites, they grew, they were fruitful, they swarmed, they increased, they got powerful and powerful, and the land was filled with them. The language is intentional. What the biblical writer is doing, he's trying to convey undeniably this account of the fulfillment concerning what God had told to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but also reads a little ominously, right? I mean, just kind of, it sounds a little threatening. And the land was filled with them, right? I mean, one of the observations that you need to make of Exodus is that it is a continuation of the book of Genesis. And there are two forces at work that one wants to topple the other and undermine. It started all the way back in Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve maligned the character of God, did not believe that God was good and sovereign and had their best interest at heart. So they chose to defy and rebel and disobey God. And God gives a prophetic word. There's gonna be this devil that's gonna bruise the heel of your seed, Adam and Eve, but your seed is gonna do what? Crush the head of the serpent. What, when did that happen? Jesus started crushing number one by rendering the powers of darkness powerless by telling sin and death and Satan where they can go. 
and eventually he will, eventually there will be an ultimate deliverance. So there's this prophetic word, there's these two cosmic forces at play and we see that Exodus is a continuation of Genesis. At every turn, schemes of the devil are seeking to undermine the plan and the purposes of God to bring discouragement and despair to God's people. But you cannot thwart the plans and the purposes of God, all right? Israel's exodus is like our exodus. In fact, one pastor described exodus like this. Exodus is the event that foreshadows or prefigures the redemption, the rescue that Jesus provided. The Exodus actually points us to the person and the work of Jesus, meaning this. If you get to know the book of Exodus well, if you listen attentively, if you reflect and consider the truth, you're going to see Jesus better and more clearly uh, in terms of what he's done on your behalf, and you're going to be moved to worship and gratitude because Israel's Exodus points to our Exodus. Individually, one by one, we read in the latter part of Exodus, that they actually had to adhere to the promise of God, the prophetic word of God, that you need to sacrifice an animal and take the blood of an animal and put it on the doorpost, and when the death angel comes marching through, because you took one life, he's gonna spare your life, which, by the way, God's judgment was indiscriminate. He walked through the camp of the Egyptians, and he walked through the camp of the Israelites, And every person, one by one, had to actually obey what God had said. One by one, just like today, the redemption and rescue that God brings happens one person by one person by one person. And they comprise the what? The church. The church universal. Collectively, what Exodus teaches us, it points us to the reality that God is saving a people for himself, that they would exit and depart from Egypt and worship him alone, which points us to the churches, not not a church, but the church, every man, woman, boy, or girl who names the name of Jesus, who surrendered to Jesus, it points us to the church's ultimate deliverance out of enslavement and brokenness in this corrupt world as God's people, the church, are brought into glorious realities called the new heavens and the new what? New earth. It's coming. It's gonna happen. Israel's exodus is like our exodus. So here's what I want to appeal to you as I close. I want you every week to do this, but the title of this sermon series is Seeing God. Seeing God in suffering, seeing God in deliverance, seeing God as the one who's faithful to his promises and seeing God as glorious and transcendent. We'll talk about those in some form or fashion every week for the next four months. But I want you to see and I want you to savor God. Not just uh, I, wanna, I wanna see and I wanna know truth uh, as if intellectual assent is all God wants. I want you to come to graciously expecting more than simply just a a good sermon and and great music. Uh, I want you to come and I want you to see and I want you to savor God. I'm hopeful and prayerful and expectant as we walk through the Bible, specifically the book of Exodus, that the Holy Spirit's gonna take my words as I seek to accurately and compellingly and Jesus honoringly use them to set my affections and your affections on fire for Jesus, that your heart would be stirred for him, that you'd feel the weight and value, the gravity of the realities of the text. This actually happened, which points us to something more profound. So let's see and savor God in the midst of suffering. Let's see and savor God as he delivers on his promises. Because even in the midst of suffering and hardship, even in the midst of us not sensing and feeling and perceiving God's purposes unfolding or as demonstrably as we would like, he's right there. He's right there. He tells us, I'll never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. I'll never abandon you. He's engaged in a unilateral covenant and promise. He's pledged himself, his allegiance to himself, 
and God has to be faithful to his promises. So let's see and savor God just as the Israelites were called to do in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardship. Let's see and savor God just as the early church did, seemingly when despair and discouragement and worry settled into their hearts as they saw their king, their Lord, their Messiah, hanging on a cross, but three days later, their joy, their joy and hope was reinstilled in their hearts. And just like today, just like today, let's see and savor God. Let's work hard to see and savor God. The book of Exodus. I hope you'll be encouraged and challenged and refreshed as we walk through this book, this awesome book over the next several weeks. Father, I pray, I pray, a cry of dependence and a commitment to the relationship. I pray, Father, that you would help us see the Bible has this thread running all throughout it that you would give us, Holy Spirit, an expectant spirit. That as we, as we sit under your word, not over top of it, not to the left of it, not to the right, but as we sit under your word, the Holy Spirit, that you would prompt us to see the awesomeness, the beauty, the goodness, the sovereignty that's demonstrated in the Bible that, God, you are bringing about your plan, your purposes. You're not slow to seeing your promises fulfilled. Help us to believe and trust that and where we struggle and we so often do, where we have questions and we so often do, where we have doubt and we so often do, may we lean into this place called Graceland, a family of believers, brothers and sisters in Jesus, who wanna follow after you imperfectly with all our struggles, but understand that this book, Exodus, these events that actually transpired in history point us to something more profound, more great, and that is we get to exit and depart from the penalty and the punishment and the enslavement and the power of sin. That we have hope and rescue and redemption and that our circumstances don't get to define truth you do. May we see and savor you. Taste as David says in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord indeed is good. We pray this with expectancy.